Hey everyone, Lou here. Yes, I know, I took a long ass time to finally make part two of this. I'll explain why in a second, but roll the intro and let's get started reviewing more anime live action movies. <laughs> Now, I took a while to make this thanks to the wonderful world of copyright. A lot of these movies were made by Warner Brothers or another studio with heavy copyright around them. So unless I wanted this video to be blocked worldwide, except for some country under the A in Atlantic that nobody's heard of, I unfortunately had to get creative with the visuals. By that, I mean gameplay sort of relating to what I'm talking about. <laughs> All right, let's begin. Now, fun fact, I actually watched this movie for the first time for this video. I gotta say this movie was absolutely brilliant that a remake feels like it's defeating the purpose of why it's so amazing in the first place. There's a lot of meticulous detail in this movie that modern Hollywood directors shoving Scarlett Johansson into everything isn't going to appreciate. And I have to say the animation first and foremost was absolutely incredible. This movie really surprised me in my expectations. I was half expecting this movie to be a really poorly acted and overall boring movie, but I was pleasantly surprised. Now there was a lot of drama regarding putting Scarlett Johansson in the role of Motoko Kisaragi, but the movie at least tries to explain it. Basically, Motoko in this movie was a rebellious young woman who hated the government and ran away from home with other rebellious young adults in some sort of tiny abandoned shrine. It looked like some sort of old shrine anyway. The government was experimenting on putting humans' brains in robot bodies, so they thought it was a great idea to take 99 rebels and homeless young adults to gruesomely experiment on them. Which, to be honest, that's pretty bold for a movie that's adapting an anime for a generic audience who probably doesn't care about what makes us human and instead want to see cool explosions. Well, Motoko and Hideo, who is her boyfriend, I guess, were basically ghosts put into shells that were completely unrecognizable and purposefully erased their past so they could be ultimately super soldiers. They would even place fake memories in what we now know as the Major to motivate her to kill terrorists. If you think about it, that could technically be commentary on having to erase the shell of a person because higher ups want it that way for the sake of a ultimately selfish goal. At least, that was my takeaway from it and I may be overanalyzing the symbolism. To be honest, I wasn't expecting this movie to actually challenge the themes of identity and memories presented in the original movie. I gotta admit, it was very interesting to see the Major slowly uncovering her past while it's still odd to say the least. I appreciate the attempt at explaining the controversy. I will praise this movie on the visuals though, because holy shit, this movie was fucking gorgeous. The special effects done by the talented people at Weta Workshop did an incredible job. Specifically, the geisha robot, because that was just really cool. Everything about this movie on a visual scale was just as fucking cool and even the audio design was amazing and they even used some of the original music chanting score thing from the 1995 film. While the story was good, the visuals themselves were just, wow, amazing. While it's more like a love letter to Ghost in the Shell as a whole, I actually recommend this movie. The acting is good, the story is interesting, and the special effects are out of this world. Not to mention the cyberpunk aesthetic here is just awesome. Now for extra research on this one, I also read the first volume of Alita Battle Angel. While this film was not directed by James Cameron, apparently this has been his dream project since the 90s, so I guess he was a major creative influence and producer on this one. However, he exclusively said in an interview I saw that a 90s OVA for Alita Battle Angel was his inspiration for this movie. So I watched the two OVAs made for Alita Battle Angel that told the story of the first two volumes for the series. 
Though I've heard that Cameron definitely read the manga or knew about it since manga story elements are actually in this movie. I don't know what they are as I haven't read the rest of Alita, but I guess it's something. This movie genuinely surprised me in its quality. I wasn't expecting direct quotes from the OVA and manga along with shot for shot remakes for how they were portrayed in the OVA. Of course, the pacing is a little wild considering it's basically summarizing 80% of the manga except for the climax, which was going to be a sequel that didn't end up happening due to the movie's bombing on release. While watching this movie, I could tell from the script and creative decisions just how much James Cameron and Robert Rodriguez genuinely love Alita as a character and a series to a point where it reflects really well in the movie. To be honest, this is one case where I actually preferred the live action movie over the OVA. I love the casting, acting, fight choreography, set design, cinematography, character designs, and even the CGI. I know a lot of people complain that Alita looks creepy, but to be honest, I thought she looked adorable. I don't know, something about her design reminded me of a pulip doll, which works considering the whole thing about Alita is she's this really tiny, cute doll looking thing, but will drop kick your ass and I love that for her. Obviously the movie has flaws. Some characters didn't look that great and I don't particularly think it's a good idea to end any movie on sequel bait because movie releases are genuinely a gamble unless you know people are gonna be hyped as shit to see it. Like, I don't know, the Deadpool movie. Overall, this movie is really good, and I think it's genuinely a faithful adaptation of Alita's manga, but more specifically the two OVAs. Not gonna lie, this movie really surpassed my expectations I had going in for it, and that's saying a lot considering it was pitting up against the almighty Speed Racer for best anime adaptation. As you all have probably noticed, if you're subscribed to this channel, if you're not, I recommend you do because I never shut up about JoJo's and Black Butler. Now, a live action JoJo's is something I surprisingly have a lot of faith in. Considering Araki is often inspired by real world fashion and celebrities like Prince, David Bowie, and Freddie Mercury, then it's not insane to imagine characters like JoJo's adapted into a real world setting. This movie covers the first arc of part 4, which is about the Nijimura brothers. So right away, I really loved what they did with Koichi here. From my assumption, his mother and sister recently moved to Morio after a presumed divorce from Koichi's father. Father. And I actually really loved his hairstyle in the movie. It's a black instead of silver, of course, but it's a style in a way that you can actually still tell it's him. Morio also looks really adorable in this movie. Something about the way Morio is designed here makes me actually want to live there. I don't know, it just looks really sweet. Let me tell you, the CGI for this movie is absolutely fucking awful. Like, obviously Ghost in the Shell had way better CGI here because it's a big budget Hollywood adaptation, but gosh damn this one is bad! I can't believe Hatsune Miku's Famimart ads had better CGI than a big budget movie. I know the stands were gonna be difficult, but gosh damn I didn't think they'd look so out of place. I will give them props for making them transparent, but major negatives for still looking so damn bad. Jeez. I wonder why a lot of these movies still have the CGI skills of Shark Boy and Lava Girl. As we progress further into film effects, I really can't imagine CGI being as difficult and as expensive as it was back in the early 2000s, especially when even YouTubers who have nowhere near the budget of a film studio managed to make some pretty good CGI effects. I guess maybe a lack of interest because of cultural difference? I'm not sure. The pacing was a little slow in some parts. Yukiko in particular felt like something to pad in for time. Though I could be saying that as Yukiko is definitely not my favorite character throughout most of part 4 until like the Cinderella arc. Some shots were also a little wonky, but those are pretty minor and not something I take away because I thought a lot of other shots were pretty cool. 
Though back to the positives, I will give major props to how this movie handled Josuke's relationship with his grandfather. While the anime did an okay job, the movie did a way better job at showing just how close Josuke was with his grandfather and how much he wanted to be like him in his own way. Well, even the casting was excellent. Josuke, Josuke's mom, Koichi, Okuyasu, and pretty much everyone else looked exactly like how I picture these characters to look in real life. Though I will say the guy playing Jotaro looks a little too old considering he's supposed to be 28 here and he looks like he's in part 6 already, but I will give him major props for showing more of Jotaro's gentle side unlike many adaptations that sort of forget Jotaro isn't just a badass. I feel like a lot of writing for this movie does that. To be honest, this genuinely was a really good adaptation of the first arc of part 4. Though considering the accurate acting so far, especially when Jotaro speaks English whenever he's on the phone with Joseph, I'd imagine it would be pretty difficult to adapt later parts when it comes to Joseph and Trasarati. Sorry by the way, Italian's not my strong suit. I mean, I doubt Japan has a large pool of British old men and fairly young-ish Italian men just lying around ready to be actors in a Japanese JoJo's Bizarre Adventures movie. Overall, this was actually a pretty good movie, not gonna lie, I was pleasantly surprised by how well this movie was made. Considering other movies here, I had pretty low expectations for the most part, but now I'm actually a little sad they probably won't be able to make more of these. Though I am eyeing that Rohan Kishibe drama series as it looks decently interesting. Ah, Attack on Titan, probably the most groundbreaking anime of the modern era considering it was the success of Attack on Titan that caused other anime to be easier to access. Despite how insane the story is now, this movie is adapting the first season of the anime and manga. Remember when this was a series about naked giants and not complicated politics? Now, for some reason, this movie decided to make this a post-apocalypse set after some kind of modern war. There's a lot of machinery lying around from the quote, ancient past. I guess that's fine, it's kind of cool. And for some reason, they gave Armin this weird quirk now where he's a tinkering inventor instead of just a curious kid. If this is set after some modern war, how the fuck did we lose to Titans if we have warplanes and literal bombs to destroy them? Everything is fine so far until you get to the Titans. Gosh, guys, I don't know how you can turn Attack on Titan into a comedy outside of the junior high school spinoff, but man, they absolutely did. The minute the Titans show up, everything is so overacted and the bad CGI somehow turns this into a Japanese sci-fi channel film and it's hilarious for that. I will give props for some of the titans, some genuinely looked really terrifying, while others, as I said, looked hilarious. Though at some point any horror movie brings on is immediately numbed because it just turns into this weird gore fest. I feel like the movie was probably meant to be viewed in 3D in Japan because I can tell from the way the blood splatters that this was actually one of those. The gore honestly just turns into an unnecessary gore fest the way the Silent Hill movies do. You just kind of become numb to it because of how often they want to show it off, which is definitely a bad idea if you're trying to horrify your audience. It doesn't help that they give the titans a goofy laugh too instead of some droning breathing sound or something. Not to mention they break the big rule of Attack on Titan in that there's no baby titans but then there's suddenly a baby titan now. Though the stupidest things about this movie is the awful CGI is so bad they practically had to make the movie grayscale to hide how bad it is. And they gave Mikasa a fake out death throughout half the damn movie and removed Levi. I'm not speaking as generic Levi fan number 42 here because I am. That's just overall stupid. Levi is the most popular character in Attack on Titan next to Eren and Hanji, and you just replace him with this Shikishima guy? What the actual fuck, dude? Hell, you fucking kept Krista but made her a mom or something, as ironic as that is. So why cut out Levi? 
Like, how stupid do you have to be on a marketing scale to exclude the most marketable character and popular character in Attack on Titan? Jeez. Not to mention how creepy this Shikishima guy is for constantly flirting with Mikasa despite, you know, Mikasa is 16 at this point in the story, so that's just a major fucking no. Overall, this movie was just boring and awful. It had its mediocre moments, but in the end, it feels like a gory fest trying to capitalize on Attack on Titan and failed at it because they removed the most marketable character in Attack on Titan. It does have an English dub though, so that was interesting at the very least. That's it for this video though, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I know you guys recommended a lot of live action anime movies from Kakegurui, Nana, Sailor Moon. There was just so many live action anime movies you guys wanted me to see. I can only put so much in a video. So let me know down below what you think and if you want to see another video like this because maybe I'll talk about those next time. Well, let me know down below what you think. Did you like any of these movies too? Are you gonna see any of them? As always, let me know down below. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you liked the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing if you're new. And if any older new subs would like to help support the channel in any possible way, my Kofi page is down below in the description along with all of my social media. For any subscribers, new or old, who would like to help with video ideas or maybe just want to talk about anime or something, then I have a fan server linked down below. See you next time!